1973, I was a postdoc uh, in molecular biology at Columbia University. And it, it was a time really of, a, of a, a lot of intense discussion. I had a lot of friends who were postdocs. Subjects came up naturally. And um, I just happened to come across um, a copy of the Wistar Symposium that was held in 1966 in Philadelphia. It's a collection of essays about Darwinian uh, theory. Uh, and I read Murray Eden's article, a critical art article about Darwinian theory, and uh, Marcel Schutzenberger's critical argument about uh, Darwinian theory. And I started talking about it with um, the other postdoctoral fellows, people who were working in the laboratory at the time. And I discovered, somewhat to my own um, surprise, that the, the arguments, which seemed so very credible, very important, uh, went virtually unanswered uh, among the biologists that I knew, uh, who tended to dismiss the arguments in a way that suggested that they hadn't really understood them, and if they had understood them, were not prepared to respond to them. And that was, that was the beginning of uh, my skepticism about Darwinian theory. When I spent a year in Paris um, working with Schutzenberger, of course, both of us enriched each other's opinions. Uh, Schutzenberger had been a long-standing critic within the French biological establishment of Darwinian theory. And what he had to say um, reinforced what I had to say, what I had to say reinforced what he had to say. Later, I talked with Murray Eden. There were, were a group of us who were similarly skeptical. I must say in the 70s, in the late uh, 60s and in the 70s, there was a much more intensive um, uh, degree of opposition to Darwinian theory, a much, a much greater willingness to um, examine Darwinian orthodoxies. Uh, the great counter-reformation took place in the 1980s and the 1990s. So when I started work, or when I started thinking about these issues, uh, Schutzenberger and I wanted to write a book together on this. Um, there, was a, there was a very relatively liberal um, attitude among mathematicians, people who were interested, uh, physicists, uh, people who were interested in Darwinian theory, a much greater willingness to, to wonder whether any of this could possibly be true. So that was roughly my own background, my own approach to it. Well, the claim that all skeptics about Darwinian uh, Orthodoxy or Christian fundamentalist stands refuted by me. It's obviously not true. I'm not, neither Christian nor a fundamentalist. Um, but lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. Uh, I know dozens of mathematicians who scratch their head and say, you guys think this is the way life originated. It's absolutely a preposterous theory. And many, many very significant figures. John von Neumann, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, just laughed at Darwinian theory. He hooted at it. Uh, so it's, it's perfectly absurd. This is a point in a polemical dispute. It's not a, a reasonable um, standard of criticism. Opposition to Darwinian theory is, I wouldn't say widespread, but there's a consistent group of people among mathematicians, among physicists, among some um, very good speculative biologists who simply don't, uh, don't accept it, don't, e don't even regard it as a scientific theory in any reasonable sense. It's, it's tough to say because we're not dealing with a theory in any sense in which, say, a physicist would uh, recognize the theory. We're dealing with a collection of anecdotes, a, a certain point of view, a series of hunches. Um, I would say that the, the most outstanding, the salient points are, first of all, the fossil record, uh, which, is, which is simply mystifying. We can't make much sense of the fossil record. It does not sustain any kind of Darwinian prediction that can be intelligently derived from Darwinian theory, and it doesn't seem to sustain anything else as far as I can see. It's, it's a, a perfectly mystifying record. That's one obvious point. I'm not talking just about the Cambrian explosion. I'm talking about everything that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the fossil record. Second point, uh, we have never been able in any way theoretically to examine the central Darwinian claim that natural selection and random variation can account for a great deal of complexity. If you look at the history of physics, for example, what did Newton do in the 17th century? He said, well, the planets are being attracted to the sun by a force. It's not any kind of force. It's an inverse square force. And then he went and showed that if you make that assumption, the result will be an orbit that conforms exactly to the observed orbit, say, of the, of the Earth or of Mars. It will be a conic section. And then he proved the converse, that if it's a conic section, the planets must be attracted to a central source by an inverse square law. There is nothing like that in biology, in Darwinian theory. A kind of a, a canonical demonstration that this mechanism, 
random variation, natural selection, is adequate to the generation of this level of complexity. From the point of view of the serious sciences, without that kind of a demonstration, one is completely adrift. You have no idea whether the mechanism is adequate for its intended purposes. This is the second point. Third evidential piece of the puzzle. Look, you turn to the serious sciences, you turn to general relativity or quantum mechanics. I can program a computer with the equations of general relativity or with the equations of quantum mechanics and I can say, all right, what are the consequences? I can actually see the consequences uh, emerge in a simulation. We can't do any of this in biology. And that, that should, should prompt any reasonable person to ask, why not? If this is such a simple mechanism, which can easily be programmed on a computer, how come we can't set up a computer and create something of biological-like complexity? How come we cannot see the unfolding of an evolutionary process the way we can see the unfolding of an evolutionary process in physics? It's a very serious question. I've looked at all the genetic algorithms. I'm trying to write a genetic algorithm myself. And, uh, and the sheer fact is, uh, without a tremendous amount of very special man manipulation and ad hoc constraints, the computer is not going to generate anything realistic if it uses Darwinian mechanisms. And it will generate something realistic only if it doesn't use Darwinian mechanisms. This is an important point. Um, Fifty years after the computer revolution began, we have a splendid tool for ex assessing the, um, the intelligibility and viability of Darwinian theory. And everything that we know, everything we, that we know, and I think this is the uniform experience of anyone working in genetic algorithms, indicates these mechanisms will not work. They will not work for their intended purposes. And finally, there's the utter absence of laboratory evidence. I mean, random variation, natural selection, we should be able to start manipulating organisms. When we look at dogs, no matter how far back we go, it's dogs. When we look at bacteria, no matter what we do, they stay bugs. They don't change in their fundamental nature. There seems to be some sort of an inherent species limitation, and we have no good explanation for this in terms of Darwinian theory. We should have far more flexibility, far more plasticity under laboratory conditions than we actually do if Darwinian theory or anything like that were correct. What we see in nature, what we see in the laboratory, is very highly bounded variation, cyclic variation. That's, for example, bin, um, uh, finch beaks in the Galap uh, Galapagos Island. That's about all we see. Small variations. Why is that if Darwinian theory is correct? These are evidentiary points that I think need to be stressed, need to be examined openly, honestly. And they never are, of course. Never are. Look, the stuff about uh, finch beaks is certainly interesting. Let's, let's not um, uh, confuse ourselves about that. Um, the question is, can it be extrapolated? Or does it represent cyclic variation? Um, I can say, here's an account of how the eagle flies. Look, I get up, I jump in the air, I flap my hands a couple of times, and I land a few feet from where I started. Thus, the origin of flight. Oh. The obvious response is, this is nutty. You can flap your hands as, as long as you want. You won't fly like an eagle. Um, the argument from extrapolation can work in some circumstances. It fails in other circumstances. Plainly, in the case of a human being who jumps two feet in the air and then lands two feet from where he started, the argument from extrapolation fails. What persuades you in the case of the Galapagos finch that what seem to be cyclic variations are the start, the commencement of a grand uh, process of speciation. That's a step in the argument that has to be completed. It's not enough to say, well, it's more of the same. It's not more of the same self-evidently. It can easily be bounded variation of exactly the same sort as we see in any species experiment. No. The contrary may be true. We may be seeing the development of entirely new species. The Galap Galapagos finch starts off as a finch, and uh, within 100 million years, there'll be a Galapagos elephant. Could be. But we need a whole lot more by way of evidence than a couple of uh, nutty journalists going down there looking at finch beaks and uh, writing a Pulitzer Prize winning book. A whole lot more of this is to be serious science. I mean, this doesn't even pass the threshold of anecdote. Uh, Finch beaks change in size. Yeah, they do. They change in shape, too. It seems to be correlated with seasons. It seems to be a regress back toward the mean when the seasons change again. If this is the part of a spectacular evolutionary extrapolation, let's have additional reasons for thinking that. Otherwise, we're not even talking about a scientific hypothesis. The interesting argument about the whale
which is a mammal after all. It belongs to the same group of organisms as a dog, a human being, a chimpanzee, or a tiger. The interesting argument about a whale is that if its origins were land-based originally, then we have some crude way of assessing quantitatively, not qualitatively, but quantitatively, the scope of the project of transformation. The project is very simple. Let's put it in vividly accessible terms. You've got a cow. You want to teach it how to live all of its life in the open ocean, still retaining its air-breathing characteristics. What do you have to do from an engineering point of view to change the cow into a whale? This is crude, but it gives you the essential idea. Now, if the same question were raised with respect to uh, a car, and you ask, what would it take to change a car into a submarine? We would understand immediately it would take a great many changes. The project is a massive, a massive engineering project of redesign and adaptation. Well, the same question occurs with respect to that proverbial cow. Virtually every feature of the cow has to be changed. It has to be adapted. But since we know that life on Earth and life in the water are fundamentally different enterprises, we have some sense of the number of changes. Um, you know, any time a science avoids coming to grips with numbers, it's somehow immersing itself in perhaps an unavoidable, but certainly an unattractive miasma. Here's a chance actually to put some numbers on calculations. We're not talking about genetics. We're talking about simple numbers. The skin has to, has to change completely. It has to become Im impermeable to water. That's one change. Breathing apparatus has to, has to change. A diving apparatus has to be put in place. Lactation systems have to be designed. The eyes have to be protected. The hearing has to be altered. Salivary organs have to be changed. Feeding mechanisms have to be changed. After all, a cow eats grass, a whale doesn't. As I say, I've tried to do some of these calculations. The calculations are certainly, certainly not hard. But they're interesting because I stopped at 50,000. That is morphological changes. And don't forget these changes are not independent. They're all linked. If you change an organism's visual system, you have to change a great many parts of its cerebellum, its cerebrum, its, its nervous system. Um, all of these changes are coordinated. So when we're talking about an evolutionary sequence such as this, what's interesting about the cow to whale transition, and I'm just using this as a easily accessible idea. What's interesting about the cow to whale transition is that we can see a different environment is going to impose severe design constraints on a possible evolutionary sequence. How are these constraints met if they're roughly 50,000? If they're 2 million constraints, how are those met? And what does this suggest about what we should see in the fossil record? To my way of thinking, if Darwinian hypotheses are correct, it should suggest an enormous plethora of animals intermediary between, say, Ambulocetus and the next step. That won't solve all problems. One wants to know what's directing this change, if anything. But at least it will put it in the ballpark of a quantitative estimate, which is hardly ever done. Questions about homology are really tricky because they tend to be exercises in circular definition. What do, what do we mean by homo homological organs? Well, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, geneticists and biologists struggled to put together a, a criteria for homology. They talk about a similarity in embryological development, similarity in function, similarity in morphological form. That's reasonable, but a little vague, a little unclear. But what inference do you make from the fact that, say, the fin in a fish is um, structured in a way that's remarkably similar to the hand in a human or in, in a chimpanzee? If the fact that you see some morphological si significance is taken as evidence for common descent, there's not much additional that you need to look for by way of evidence because the issue is definitional. If it's not taken as evidence for common descent, what do you need to complete the inference to common descent? Um, there are plenty of, plenty of examples of homological structures in biology which are obviously not based on, 
on common descent. For example, uh, take the uh, Australian wolf, um, which, except for the reproductive system, um, features a wide variety of organ systems that are absolutely homological to the North American timber wolf. But there's no evidence that these homological structures arose because some wolf at some time in the past or some uh, proto-wolf um, decided first to migrate to Australia and then to migrate to North America. The evolutionary lines are completely distinct, and yet we see a profound degree of homology. We see this throughout the animal kingdom. Um, the whole issue of homology, commonality of form, is riddled with a, a, a great deal of, of philosophical uncertainty because it's never clear what the evidence is, what the evidence is for, and how one is to avoid completely circular reasoning. What is clear what is clear is that within family groupings, there are profound similarities in structure. We can say that. But whether they arise because of some constraints in the, in the circumstances of life, or because there's a genuine explanation in terms of a common ancestor, we just don't know in many cases. Uh, the entire mammalian um, group of animals, for example, all of the mammals, have many, many properties in common. Why this should be, we don't know. For example, the, the pentapod nature of uh, all extremities. Um, why is five preferred in the mammalian kingdom and not seven or 13 or 52? It's, it's an obviously interesting question. Uh, if we say that it is because the mammalian, um, mammalian organisms were derived ultimately from fish, then we have a profound number of problems in that uh, pectoral and pelvic girdles also obey the rule of five. They also obey the rule of five. Uh, where did this constraint come from? It's not entirely clear. The idea that mutations are considered the engines of evolution has only one problem. There's no evidence to support it. Um, as far as we know, and that's a considerable problem, not an overwhelming problem for a scientific theory. There are plenty of scientific theories that lasted a long time with absolutely no evidence. Um, but the idea that, that mutations are the driving force encounters a fatal difficulties. Almost all mutations are deleterious. Almost all of them do the organism absolutely no good. In fact, we have a devilishly hard time finding any mutations that do the organism any good whatsoever. That's one problem. The second problem is that by now, we should be um, attentive enough to look for uh, contrived circumstances in which we can test this idea that mutations, by definition random, by definition, random, um, work is the engine of evolution. What we have are a variety of lifelike systems, books, for example, or computer, uh, computer codes. And what we know is that unless we do a lot of careful stage management, arbitrary events in either books or computer codes tend to screw the code of the book up irreparably. Now, there's a, a large question here. If I take a copy of Windows, um, 2000 XP, and I start introducing random changes, uh, within a very short while the code will crash, the whole system will be useless. Why exactly is this not happening in living systems? I, I don't want a lot of hand-waving in response, I want a precise quantitative answer. Living systems don't experience catastrophic failure under random mutations because. And if you know, tell me. I'll take your call day or night. Let's look at the thing this way. What, what does the Darwinian theory say? What is the Darwi Darwinian anecdote? There are arbitrary changes, meaning the changes are perfectly random. We have no idea when they will occur, and they're not linked to changes that have occurred. And after the changes have occurred, there's a deterministic process which calls out those changes that are valuable and saves those changes uh, which are not, uh, and extrudes those changes which are not. So the process is both one of sheer dumb luck, finding the right changes, and something that is not quite a matter of luck, that is quite deterministic, that is saving the valuable changes. Nonetheless, Darwinian theory suggests that each such episode, luck, change, luck, change, is independent. It has nothing to do with the one that went before. So that in the abstract, it could be modeled by what mathematicians call a random variable. At, a, at first cut, first approximation. When I talk about sheer dumb luck, I mean the amazing fact that these extraordinary, ineffably beautiful structures arise 
from what is at its heart a stochastic, that is to say, a random process. Now, no one is arguing, say, that if a tiger, a toothless tiger, develops a set of splendid dentures capable of biting its prey, it will improve its chances of survival. That seems obvious. It seems, in fact, so obvious that it's hard to imagine that a scientific theory is needed to explain it. The pigeonhole principle explains it. The pigeonhole principle tells you if you have ten letters and only nine mailboxes, one letter has to go. That seems to be at work in Darwinian theory as an underlying assumption as well. Hardly need a, a hundred years of biology to tell us that. But the essential point is that the structure of the theory is uh, arguably stochastic. Each event, each episode, each bright bursting episode of change is independent of the one that went before and independent of the one that's going to come after. That's what I meant by sheer dumb luck. A hard time imagining that I myself am the product of sheer dumb luck. I like to see, uh, think of all of evolution groaning its way toward the accomplishment of the noble and lovely thing that is me. But of course, as a critic of Darwinian theory, I, I don't hold with that. Um, of course, I find it difficult to imagine that any contemporary state of affairs is the result of essentially a random process. Um, not difficult for theological, not difficult for religious, not difficult for any reasons of the sacred, but difficult because we have an enormous amount of experience with the underlying kind of processes in mathematics and statistics, and we never see anything like that. I imagine that uh, Juan Luis Borges, the famous writer, was offering an account of the origins of every contemporary novel. And uh, as is wont, um, he, he argued that all novels are really one novel, that is Don Quixote, and that all novels would, were derived from the Quixote by random copying changes in an obscure group of Cistercian French monks. Um, when I wrote that, I wanted to poke fun at Darwinian theory, but the more I thought about it, the more it seemed perfectly reasonable that that should be the account of the origins of the novel. Uh, you began with Don Quixote in the 15th century, 16th century. You had groups of monks who didn't speak any Spanish, didn't speak any French, uh, copying it, as medieval monks, uh, monks copied the Bible. And they introduced copying errors. And sure enough, after a certain amount of time, Don Quixote changed to war and peace. Uh, different language, different notation, different elements, um, but essentially a process of copying errors. Um, if we find that preposterous, and I certainly do, little shiver could, should go up our backs when we think of the analog an analogous claim being made in the context of biology. The idea that uh, science is a uniquely self-critical institution is, of course, preposterous. Scientists are no more self-critical than anyone else. They hate to be criticized, and they never criticize themselves. Um, Given, given the, the, the enormously long span of human history, this is um, a prediction that one would expect to be true, and it is true. Uh, there are local mechanisms of criticism in science. I mean, within established theories, if somebody publishes data that um, don't work out in the right way, or if there are mathematical flaws in a certain theory, uh, these tend to get known. But large global criticisms of the scientific enterprise are very, very difficult to find, and uh, certainly are not being promulgated by the scientists themselves with any great ebullience or enthusiasm. Look, these people are only human. They hate criticism. Me too. Me too. It's not a surprise. Um, the idea that scientists are absolutely eager to be beaten up, that's one of the myths uh, put out by the scientists, and it works splendidly so that they can avoid criticism. If somebody's got a lot of money at stake, a lot of research money, the words, uh, I don't have a clue, are guaranteed to end his, his or her funding. Um, if someone is relatively free to say exactly what they, what they feel like saying, yeah, there are people who say, we really don't know. We're really in the dark about this. So a lot of it depends on the institutional constraints of science itself. We're asking for standards of behavior that it would be... Uh, wonderful to expect, but that no serious man actually does expect. A uh, hundred years of fraudulent drawings suggesting embryological affinities that don't exist, that's just what I would expect if biologists were struggling to maintain a position of power in a secular democratic society. Let, let's be reasonable. We're all sophisticated men and women here. I mean, the, the, the popular myth of science is a uniquely self-critical institution, and scientists as men who would rather be consumed at the stake rather than fudge their data. I mean, that's, that's okay for a PBS special. 
But that's not the real world. That's not what's taking place. I mean, people fudge the data whenever they can get away with it. Uh, and they, they will uh, commit themselves to fraudulent drawing just so long as they're convinced that no one's looking over their shoulder. And it's, it's unrealistic, unsophisticated, and unwise to expect people to do anything other than that. Think of your last traffic ticket. Yeah, you bet, officer. I was doing 98 miles per hour <laughs> in a 30 mile an hour school zone. When was the last time you told the cop that? And yet we expect the biologist to say exactly the same thing about uh, drawings which have been his stock and trade for the last hundred years. The much more relevant question is how, how is it that we live in a society where uh, the point of view, the splendidly cynical point of view I'm adumbrating right now is not common wisdom and we don't look more closely at what these people say. One of the reasons that people embrace Darwinian orthodoxy with such an unholy zealousness is just that it gives them access to power. It's as simple as that. Power over education, power over political decisions, power over funding, and power over the media. No one in a society which is openly contemptuous of religious expression in any form wants to be identified with the side at which the intellectuals and the uh, leaders of taste and opinion are going to snicker. This again is human, human nature. We would not expect the philosopher to be boisterous in his denunciation of Darwinian theory if it could cause people at the faculty club to whisper about him. And that's exactly what we find. Tremendous amount of pressure uh, in this society or any other to conform to socially accepted beliefs, strategies of uh, evidence, appraisal, and the like. Well, well, the idea that, that the scientific enterprise is, is governed by a majority of opinion, it's not entirely a foolish idea. I mean, we can't, we can't get rid of it uh, completely and say that the truth is so unassailable that it can be discovered by one individual uh, inevitably running against uh, the tide of every other individual. There has to be some consensus and some points of view of science. Um, and, and to suggest that the fact that so many biologists are willing publicly to endorse Darwinian theory is of no account is foolish. Uh, to a certain extent, I do agree with that. It, it is important to present uh, within an educational uh, establishment what is the standard, the mainstream, the canonical view. There's, there's no question about that. But at the same time, for heaven's sake, let's open up the discussion a little bit and present some countervailing views. At least to the extent of, of um, appraising Darwinian theory, um, in the context that realistically portrays it for what it is. A kind of amusing 19th century collection of anecdotes that is utterly unlike anything we see in the serious sciences. That would be my favorite position. Um, yeah, biologists do agree um, that this is the correct theory for the origin and, and um, diversification of life, but here are some points you should consider as well. One, the theory doesn't have any substance. Two, it's preposterous. Three, it's not supported by the evidence. And four, the fact that the biologists are uniformly in agreement about this issue could as well be explained by some solid Marxist interpretation of their economic interests. That would satisfy me. It's not asking for much, is it? We don't know anything about the progress of science. Um, as far as we can tell, it depends on... Uh, unique, unrepeatable events, the confluence of genius and inspiration. And um, in between those unique and unrepeatable events, there's a lot of patient work of accumulation uh, of data, facts, theory, testing, assessment. Um, it's not even clear that science is progressing. Um, it, it, might be, it might be moving in a circular pattern, ever, ever um, uh, deeper entrenchment of a, a single set of ideas. That certainly seems to be true in physics. Has physics progressed beyond Newtonian mechanics? Well, it's certainly been enriched. It certainly has uh, acquired additional concepts, additional powers. Whether the powers are due to technological development or theoretical insight is another issue. Um, I don't think we should make any large claims about the progress of science. We understand science as little as we understand the cosmos. I think, realistically speaking, we're hundreds of years away. 
from having the same kind of understanding of living systems as, as we possess in parts of physics. And what we understand of physics deals with a very, very small range of experiences in the material world. That shouldn't be forgotten. And also, I turn on the faucet. I don't have a series of equations that can describe turbulent water flow. I just don't have that. Um, aerodynamics is not properly understood. Turbulence is not properly understood. And that's Newtonian mechanics. We certainly don't have a, uh, a rock-solid understanding of the behavior of technological and material objects in the contemporary world. We have a lot of anecdotes. No reason to expect progress in biology is going to be any more um, rapid than uh, developments in physics. Why the assumption of celerity, that things should just happen bang, 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 we'll, we'll understand everything at once? There are very deep conceptual issues in biology, very, very deep, very profound areas, not only of ignorance, but of understanding. This is a country with all too much civility. It really is, especially on important issues. But look how much we've lost in this country. I would encourage you to this. Go back to the 1920s, 1930s. Pick up anything that H.L. Mencken has written, for example. Robert Ingersoll, H.L. Mencken... A um, handful of critics, and ask yourself, could one write this way today about important issues? And we've lost something in this country because we've become afraid of controversy, afraid of polemics. That's not a healthy thing. It's invigorating. <laughs> the question whether name-calling is evidence of an imaginative paucity is hardly a fair question to put to me. I mean, because um, I revel in the name calling, and when I don't have an argument, I tend to um, abuse my opponents just as easily as they tend to abuse me. Again, I, I don't think too much should be made of that. Um, there is um, a pattern. Uh, it's not a scientific pattern. It's a pattern in human affairs. When people haven't been criticized in a long time, they react with a great deal of indignation when they're criticized for the first time. That's human nature. Uh, I mean, uh, put yourself in the position of a Daniel Dennett or a Richard Dawkins who are used to being uh, the regnant priests of a powerful orthodoxy, and uh, for the first time in their lives someone says, hey, you guys are simply not credible. Of course they're going to react with outrage and indignation, uh, hurl uh, imprecations at others, uh, resort to objurgations. That's, that's only normal. If, if I remark that Daniel Dennett had, a, had his last idea in 1936 and it was under prenatal influences, what's wrong with that? It just sharpens the debate. It puts a lot of emotional um, emphasis on the debate and it forces people to come up with something better. That's the real point of name calling. It forces people to come up with something better. There are other factors at work. Decline in standards of uh, vituperation. America used to be a country rich in insults. It really did. And we lose something in literary or intellectual culture when that's, that's no longer accessible. Um, you get a guy like Daniel Dennett, whose greatest intellectual achievement was growing that stupid beard of his, uh, masquerading as a, as a scientific expert on Darwinian theory, staring at the camera, and no one is dousing him with a bucket of water. It's incredible to me. Richard Dawkins is accepted as a great intellect and a fine prose stylist, too. The guy writes them, his prose resembles a string of sponges strung together on a wash line. Should be said. Should be said. And this isn't a question of, of, uh, of hatred. It's the question, the question of the effective expression of indignation. There's no reason the democratic society has to be afraid of that. Go after the guys. Uh, we've become very defensive, very timid. I mean, look, the fact that we have to justify an attack on Darwinian theory is a very sad commentary on the health of American society. It shouldn't require a justification. It shouldn't. And yet it does. I mean, a very timorous, uh, very timorous aspect to American society right now. It's gone to the black community, um, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but no community in America has um, mastery of, um, of, the, of the contemporary language of invective, insult, argo, as, as the black community does. Trouble is not enough of the guys in the black community are devoting their talents to attacking Darwinian theory or quantum mechanics. That's the trouble. Get these rappers off MTV, put them to work, focus direction on Darwin.
Somebody's going to get discouraged in high school because he's dealing with a muttonhead as a high school biology teacher. Uh, he better not go into science at all. Uh, it really is a tough field. There's a lot of abuse. It's a very difficult enterprise. And uh, you shouldn't be discouraged easily. Um, the only thing you should take from your experience is the standing refutation of the doctrine of the survival of the fittest that every high school instructor in biology provides. Uh, you know, every education is experienced not only because of your teachers, but in spite of your teachers. I mean, I remember myself as a high school student, uh, dumb as a post, completely inarticulate, incapable of reading, uh, certainly incapable of writing. Um, and I rather suspect my experience is pretty general. I mean, not many people are enthusiastic about contemporary high school students. That's one point. It's a factual point, whether they are or are not capable. But certainly in a democratic society, the idea that the high school has to be um, a kind of enlarged locker room where only the coach's pep talk is considered reasonable. That should be repugnant. That's not really how we want an educational establishment to, to be run, is it? Um, let's give high school students the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that they're a whole lot more intelligent, presentable, better dressed, better groomed, smarter, more sophisticated than they give every appearance of being. What's the, what's the loss? What do we risk? Just what do we risk if some of the, um, the profound, exciting, deeply perplexing, uh, vexing issues of biology are presented honestly?